Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and uh, I uh, work at CSIS, where I work on um, studying China, China's domestic politics, foreign policy. Um, I'm really excited for today's latest Interpret China event. Um, these are a series of events we have been running through our uh, Interpret China project, which attempts to leverage new translations um, to um, facilitate a more sort of complex, nuanced discussion uh, about China. So we've been doing events on energy security, Chinese assessments of, of US um, China policy. We've been looking at how Chinese scholars are looking at the evolving relationship with Russia. And today, a, a really important, interesting topic on Chinese assessments of the Soviet Union's collapse. And as with uh, almost all history, uh, it's as much about the present and the future as it is about accurate assessments of, of the past. And that is certainly true with how uh, Chinese scholars have been continually assessing and reassessing uh, the events of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Also, this is an important and interesting way to get into um, or provide another lens to try to understand how China's political and ideological systems are evolving. Certainly for those of us trying to look at China from the United States, it's becoming more difficult to attempt to get an accurate read. So uh, finding new, uh, new pathways to try to increase our, our insight and understanding of China um, are important. We brought together just an absolutely fantastic uh, panel today to help make sense of this. These are four experts who have been thinking deeply about uh, China, China's political system, the legacies of socialism, uh, the importance of uh, and, and shifting nature of, of ideology uh, in China, and also uh, about how China has looked at um, its uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I first wanna give a, a particular note of thanks to Mark, Martin Dimitrov, who has been a, a guest on uh, a CSIS podcast who helped lead and, and facilitate and organize a closed door CSIS workshop on this same topic and also helped select the documents that we have translated, which provide the undergirding of today's discussion. So in a, in a liter literal and, and metaphorical sense, we, we couldn't have done this without um, Martin. And he also helped bring together uh, the rest of today's panel. So really excited to have uh, uh, Chan Chung, who is a professor of political science at the University of, of Albany, SUNY. Jeremy Friedman, who's the Martin Bauer Associate Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School, and He Nan, who's Associate Professor of International Relations at, at Lehigh University. Um, if you go to the Interpret China um, website and go to the library, you will see um, an initial set of documents which are going to form the foundation of our um, of our discussion today. We've also put this in one um, easy downloadable PDF on the event page for this specific event. So please don't read them now. Please listen. But when this event is done, um, uh, uh, if you haven't already, just recommend you you peruse those documents. Um, uh, and also say, if you go to the event webpage, you'll see that there is a button to click if you want to uh, ask a question. Those will be sent to me and I'll be um, where applicable and, and apposite, I will uh, pose those to, um, to the group. So with, with that being said, uh, let me, um, now kick off the formal part of this uh, discussion with our, our experts here today. And at a, a high level, I might just ask the group and maybe Martin, I will start with you to help situate us here. Um, why, is this, uh, an, why is this topic of how the Communist Party is assessing the collapse of the Soviet Union important? And, and more importantly, why is the CCP still interested in this topic. There's a vast amount of literature continually pushed out through party journals, um, history journals, uh, political journals, governance journals, journals that think about party building, 
they're still really fixated on this topic of why the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union collapsed. And I'm curious if you can just sketch out for us, why does this matter? Thank you, Jude. Uh, first, thank you for uh, convening uh, this, this event. I, I'm delighted to be uh, part of this uh, discussion. Um, the question of the collapse of the Soviet Union, from my point of view, is a question of vital importance for the Chinese Communist Party because, of course, it doesn't want to collapse. And it was not until 89-91 when we had both the domestic events in China, but also what happened in Eastern Europe, and then eventually the Soviet collapse, that communist parties um, around the world started to collapse. Up to that point, they looked very strong. And of course, some segments of society hoped that eventually there might be a collapse, but nobody, uh, everybody seemed to be surprised by these collapses. So this moment, um, both the domestic events in China in the spring of 89, then the fall of 89 in Eastern Europe, and then the Soviet collapse in, in 91 allowed the Chinese Communist Party to engage in um, introspection and to draw lessons that it would then apply to avoid um, a, similar, a similar fate in the future. So even though 30 years have passed, the relevance of the question has not receded. It remains an essential question when the Chinese Communist Party is thinking about its future. I also, you know, Martin, one of the things that came out in our workshop discussion is just um, how assessments of the of the collapse of the Soviet Union have uh, changed over time, right? Um, which is the case in any historical event. There's no static understanding of history, but uh, I wonder if I can put to the group, um, um, how has how has thinking about the collapse of the Soviet Union changed since the early 1990s when Chinese analysts first began to put their shoulder into trying to understand dynamics. Um, I, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. I don't know if anyone has any um, thoughts, Jeremy or, or Inan or, or, or Chung, any sort of high level thoughts on how this thinking has changed over time? Uh, sure, uh, I can start. Thank you, Jude. Um, so I think, I think the biggest headline um, is that the shift over time has gone from sort of looking at you know long-term structural issues with the Soviet Union, so problems with the Soviet economy, for example, um, towards um, a more singular emphasis on the ideological problems under Gorbachev. So what you know, kind of the background of what is now called historical nihilism in China, the idea that you know once upon a time they were looking for structural deficits, and now they're looking for what did Gorbachev and the people around him do wrong at the very end. And so it's shifted kind of from you know economics and bureaucracy as an explanation towards ideology. Um, and I think there are some other shifts as well. So one thing that I noticed, for example, um, is you know in terms of the role of outside influences, um, early on. Uh, they sort of minimize the role of outside influences. So, you know, the United States was not that important a part of story, um, despite, you know, what was being told the United States about how, you know, Ronald Reagan brought down the USSR. Um, the Chinese didn't see the United States as an important part of the story. I think as time has gone on, um, there's a larger and larger role for sort of, you know, the nefarious attempts of the West at, you know, ideological manipulation, peaceful evolution is a term that's used. Um, you know, and this goes, we'll talk later about this, of course, but this goes hand in hand with you know, greater emphasis on ideological control inside of China, the idea that, you know, the West is playing this subversive role. So I think those are two, you know, key trajectories that have been, we've seen so far. Um, I just wanted, to, I agree with everything that the Martin and Jeremy have said. I just wanted to add that um, from the ACES we've been asked to review, uh, you can see a um, cont contestation or debate <clears throat> about the lessons and uh, um, although the the articles that are only published recently, but the, the views have appeared or reappeared over the past 30 years, which I see as a parallel to or mirror the intra-party debate about a range of crucial strategic choices about domestic and foreign strategies like uh, economic and political reforms, regime legitimacy, Chinese model of socialism and relationship with the West and so on and so forth. So the, uh, as Martin has mentioned, the, the disintegration process of the Soviet bloc paralleled the post-Tiananmen uh, intra-party struggle between the uh, reformists slash pragmatists who wished to carry on the reform and openness program uh, that had started a decade ago and the conservatives slash leftists who were determined to shut out Western thought through peaceful evolution and tighten the party's grip on Chinese society. And these two sides have uh, since wrestled with each other, which has 
implications for the political debate uh, within China about how to run the country. So if you uh, run a quick browse of the CNKI database and the People's Daily uh, Library, you can find that it's only from the Hu and Jiang, uh, actually, actually from Je, uh, Hu Jintao era that the phrase historical nihilism began to be used when assessing um, the lesson of Soviet collapse, but it was only used occasionally. It was until uh, Xi Jinping came to office uh, uh, that it became a frequent keyword. And, and Xi Jinping came, entered the office with a self-imposed uh, mandate to prevent the collapse of the Soviet-like uh, collapse of the communist rule. And uh, he has his solution to this problem has been fixated on a very simple logic, which is that the more firmly the party is in control of all aspects of the Chinese society, and the more concentrated power is in individual great leaders' hands, and the more this uh, communist rule will be prolonged. And to keep the commanding height, the party must ensure what they call uh, ideological security. So I think that's what Jerome had mentioned, that the shift towards more of emphasis on uh, ideological principles. Chung, um, is there anything you want to add? Yes, um, I obviously agree with most of the points that the, uh, the other panelists mentioned. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that all these pieces were written in the Xi era, um, knowing how social sciences in China work. Um, they naturally reflect the priorities um, pursued by the current uh, leadership. And I think they also conform to Xi's worldview to a large extent. Um, so looking at the past literature on the Soviet collapse, you know, you kind of get the impression that uh, much of this actually mirrors what's been going on um, in the Western literature, um, you know, sort of debating over the importance of structure versus agency, um, material versus ideational factors. But um, these recent analysis, I feel like all of them seem to converge on one decisive factor, which is the decay of the CPSU itself, the decay of the party state itself. And that, I think, to an extent, really reflects his uh, own thinking and his policy priorities. If you look at some of his policy priorities, you know, many of them, I would say, um, could be seen as directly addressing some of these identified flaws in the Soviet system. This may be an unanswerable question, but I'm curious if, <clears throat> was there a point in previous Soviet studies in China where it felt like there was more opus, more open introspection about all of the heterogeneous elements that led to 1989? Or has this always been a very sort of, to, to Chung's point, top-down, um, instantiation of what the leader's sort of preferred framing is? Well, maybe I could uh, take this this one, uh, uh, Jude. Um, as um, the first essay in, in the collection of essays that we all read, uh, Professor Zhuo Fengrong's uh, essay makes clear in the 1990s and in the early aughts, there was um, greater pluralism in terms of scholarly inquiry, and there was a lot more interest in these structural factors in, in, in various institutional problems. So I think it's it's quite interesting, for me at least, what are some of the issues that no longer get all that much play in terms of reasons for the Soviet collapse. One was the um, extraordinary uh, heft of the military expenditures of the Soviet Union, that essentially the Soviet Union spent itself out of existence because of its military budget. And this is something that Professor Zhuo herself has written about in, in the 1990s, uh, 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 a very well-researched uh, monograph uh, in Chinese. Another uh, question that somehow doesn't get much play is the ethnic tensions within the Soviet Union uh, itself um, and um, uh, uh, in, in some of the East European countries that were eth ethnically heterogeneous. Um, this was, for certain scholars, uh, one of the dominant explanations for the Soviet collapse, the um, ethnic uh, mobilization in the Soviet Union. Um, and then the, from my point of view, the third angle is that in the 1990s, the Soviet collapse was always portrayed as something that occurred as part of a general trend of collapses in Eastern Europe. 
And these collapses were discussed at great length. Um, uh, some of the discussions were about leadership divisions, uh, party ossification, and the like. And those appear to have fallen uh, on the wayside. Um, so for, from my point of view, we have converged towards um, the, this ideological explanation that, that um, Jeremy, Inan, and, and Chen have all uh, highlighted. Uh, yes, I would echo the Martin's point about this general you know, increasing uh, trend to overlap, uh, will overlook the bottom-up uh, agency uh, from the ethnic uh, minorities and the uh, Soviet society as a whole uh, versus the top-down approach that most of the Chinese experts have taken. There's some variations across these four aces, but not, not significant enough to really uh, make a big difference here. So overall, these Chinese experts believe that it's always something that the party, the leaders and government cadres did right or wrong that have uh, uh, caused the, the collapse, uh, but they generally downplay or disregard the bottom-up forces that fundamentally prepared the Soviet disintegration, such as the, the nationalist mobilization, identity politics in minority uh, areas and public opinion support for political liberalization, so on and so forth. So the, the discussion over a science uh, a very little uh, agency to the, the societal impetus from the bottom up. Uh, one exception is a Joe, a John and John's article, they touched a little bit on the party's disengagement from the mass and its loss of uh, Mingxing the public support, uh, but they still focus on the party's self-improvement and treat the mass as something that can be harnessed or uh, manipulated if the party policy is made right. I know Zuo, so Fu Rong uh, did some research uh, other than the, the essays we've, we're reviewing today. She wrote something about the, uh, China's nationality uh, policy, um, uh, I'm sorry, Soviet nationality policy and what China can learn from it. But still, it, they don't get deeper enough into uh, how the uh, cultural and political uh, and historical factors that uh, played a role in the uh, ethnic unrest uh, uh, in the former Soviet Union. And if, if I could add one point to that, um, it's worth putting into context that, you know, yes, obviously the, the study of the collapse of the USSR begins, you know, in 89, 91, um, but Chinese academia and the CCP was very closely following events inside the Soviet Union when it was live. Um, and it was reciprocated, of course, that the, the Soviets were very much following in, in, you know, events inside China. So the analysis of the Soviet Union was an ongoing project you know, going back to the beginning of the, of, of the PRC in 1949. Um, and, you know, during the years when the Soviet Union still existed, especially the years when it, you know, still seemed a viable project, um, the key interest was mostly in the Soviet economy. Um, so how the Soviet economy was performing, how essentially planned economy was performing. Um, and so I would say, you know, that that really has shifted over time. You know, as as time has gone on, there's less and less interest in, in the economy and, you know, building up something that, you know, uh, Inan Ho said, um, when you read about the economy now in more recent analyses of the Soviet collapse, it's much more about corruption inside the party, you know, the stagnation inside the party, the loss of contact between the party and the people, um, and much less about sort of, you know, systematic stories about, you know, what does it mean to have a centrally planned economy, where's the role for innovation, those sorts of things, those have gone by the wayside. Jeremy, can I ask a, um, a follow-up to that? And this was a comment that was made by one or at least I interpreted this to be the comment made by one participant in our workshop, which is, should we think about this body of work as uh, Chinese analysts studying the collapse of the Soviet Union, or should we think about this as a, 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 a late chapter in a broader discussion of Chinese analysts looking at the Russian state and the Soviet Union and how it has evolved over the course of its history? So I think, of course, there are elements of both, but I would I would still incline more towards uh, the former because okay. there's a tremendous amount of you know discussion about Marxism and the role of Marxism and how you employ Marxism, um, and that you know does obviously does not trace back as much to the, you know, the history of the Russian Empire and such. So there's interest in the Russian state, but I don't think you know I mean they see the Russian economy is very different, Russian history is very different. Um, it's not something necessarily that China looked to as you know an example 
but in the 19th century or the 18th century. So I think it's it's very much, there's a concentration on Marxism um, and that's why the application of Marxism and that's why it's really the former, I think. One other sort of high level question um, and Enon and Chong, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this is how, um, what role does China's assessment of the sort of international order um, play in, in, in sort of shifts in how it's thinking about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Jeremy had mentioned, for example, you hear more about external forces playing a, a role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, perhaps totally coincidentally, you're hearing a lot more discussion about sort of hostile foreign forces, you know, a, as um, subversive agents under Xi Jinping. So I'm curious, um, um, the role of sort of China's assessment of, of its external environment how that shapes how it has moved, you know, through time and thinking about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Chung, okay. we'll start with you. All right. I think it's actually somewhat reassuring that the Soviet Union's imperialistic overreach, uh, including its disastrous invasion of I think, Afghanistan uh, and its failure to build constructive uh, relationships with capitalist countries were actually identified as serious flaws. Um, so this would suggest that China would still likely to avoid open military conflicts outside of the sphere of its claimed sovereignty um, and try to pursue relationships with the West in the future. Um, at the same time, of course, um, there is something pretty worrying in the uh, emphasis on the so-called peaceful evolution and the role played by the so-called fifth column. So this suggests that the regime will continue to enhance China's international propaganda efforts in order to counter Western uh, ideology and narrative. Uh, domestically, I think that uh, it basically means continue to tighten control over organizations and individuals with foreign backgrounds, uh, foreign fundings. Um, it will ramp up counterintelligence efforts, as evidenced by the recent uh, um, expansion of China's counter espionage law, and also to enhance cooperation with like-minded regimes such as Russia to counter potential colored revolutions. So I think these are um, pretty natural conclusions, you know, if you read this uh, analysis when it comes to the uh, international aspects. But in general, I would say the international aspects are being sort of downplayed in this analysis. Um, uh, in particular, uh, the Soviet Union had indeed made a series of foreign policy blunders, uh, inflicting a lot of um, pain on itself, um, alienating its allies. Um, so, I'm I was actually kind of surprised that none of that really um, was mentioned in this analysis. Inan, I think you had. Um, yeah, I, I think what Chen said are all very true. Uh, I just want to go back to my earlier point about this uh, the literature about lessons on Soviet collapse is still a subject of uh, debate. Um, so the, you can draw different conclusions or policy prescriptions depending on what kind of uh, lessons uh, you learn from the uh, Soviet history. So if you believe that the Soviet empire fell apart to large extent because one overexpansion and excessive competition with the capitalist world, two, failure to engage uh, Western political reform early enough or in correct fashion, then the lesson for China would be to foster international openness and encourage close interdependence with the West while prioritizing economic development over military buildup uh, at home. But uh, conversely, if you learn the lesson the loss of the Communist Party rule and the, the dissolution of the uh, state are blamed on the Soviet leaders like Gorbachev or Khrushchev, uh, who consciously or unconsciously served as agents of Western subversion, the so-called fifth column. Uh, then the policy prescription for China would be to limit and tightly control and monitor both official and unofficial interactions with the West, close off China to foreign influence, and at the same time build up internal balance, even at the expense of economic performance and social welfare. 
and, and, and unfortunately, the later, the, the, the second uh, lesson, lesson type of lesson seems to be the trend of Chinese foreign policy since the past decade, which is turning increasingly confrontational and vigilant toward countries that China viewed as sources of threat to its core interests. And here, core interests, as we know, is defined for first and foremost, the security of the party rule, followed by national security and economic interests. And as Chen mentioned, that China's recent uh, move to expand its anti-espionage law and blocking foreign access to Chinese economic and the demographic data attest to this very, very worrisome inward-looking trend. Just if, link, sorry, go ahead, please. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, just say that I, I fully agree with the points that uh, both uh, Cheng and Inan uh, have just made. And I think um, one aspect that I want to emphasize is something that Inan mentioned earlier, which is this ideological security. And I feel that this is also a feature of the last decade where the national security law has formally integrated cultural security, which is a type of ideological security, as one type of uh, um, national security priority for the Xi Jinping administration. So this ties into some of the points that were made about how external ideas of, of peaceful evolution, but, but also democracy, media openness, and the like, are seen as direct threats by the um, Chinese Communist Party, and it wants to limit the impact of, of these ideas on Chinese society and to uh, promote um, um, domestic um, um, culture as an alternative to these uh, dangerous um, external um, ideological uh, trends. Um, this, this, is, this is all I wanted to say, a short point. Um, can, can I jump in for please, one? Please, please. Yeah, just to build off the, the last thing that Martin said, I think it's important to, to emphasize that ideological security is important, and that means, you know, controlling what comes in from outside. Um, but one thing that shows up a lot in these analyses is the idea that, you know, you can't just play defense, you have to play offense. Um, there has to be a vital development of Marxism within China. It has to be alive, and it has to connect to Chinese tradition in important ways. So it has to be a Chinese version of Marxism that connects to Chinese history, um, and so, you know, if you're not, essentially, if you're not offering people some sort of positive ideological program, you can't just play defense forever. So there's like, this goes along with what we see in terms of, um, you know, re-emphasizing the study of Xi Jinping thought and Marxism and, you know, developing them into sort of contemporary fields of ideology. I fully I agree with Jeremy. So the Chinese dream is, is also one example of, you know, this type of, you know, positive cultural message that the administration is promoting. A comment I should have made at the outset, um, which is more of a methodological comment, is, you know, one of the things we're trying to do here is talk about a, a broader phenomenon with a, a very um, uh, sort of small group of inputs, right? So we've chosen four articles. This is not the only four articles that exist. I don't think we would have time you know, uh, uh, nor would my brain be able to to go through reading, you know, a thousand articles on this topic, which we certainly could have. So we're, we're trying to sort of make some guarded conclusions while certainly recognizing that this is not the totality of, of, of the discussion. Um, but I, I, you know, maybe Chung, I wanted to ask you a question before we start getting into some of the specifics here. How should we make sense as as external observers of of what these articles say about the larger question is this simply are these are these a group of experts who are uh, within constraints of accepted narratives genuinely trying to explore a, a, an empirical question or or a um, philosophical empirical or methodological question of soviet collapse should we in, interpret these scholars work as just it's essentially downstream of whatever Xi Jinping says. Um, just help us think through from your perspective, what is the importance uh, or implications of these sorts of articles coming out? What are they trying to do? Is this, some of these like the Li Shunming, I think are more propaganda. Some of these, especially the first piece, which is a, a, a sort of a, a lit overview or a lit review, 
I think are more sort of empirically minded to try to take stock at the field. But just for us lay people here in the United States who try to look at this, um, how would you describe what these articles are trying to accomplish? Well, I will say a little bit of both. Um, obviously, you know, being social scientists in China means that you ha have to actually conform to the official view. So that is why it's particularly surprising, you know, when you see a little criticism of, you know, the Soviet Union's abandoning of collective leadership, um, a criticism on the Soviet Union's um, power concentration. So that was um, something that, quite surprising, you know, given the fact that so many of the other points raised by the authors really conform to Xi Jinping's thoughts and uh, Xi Jinping's priorities so well. Uh, but of course, you know, at the same time, um, I do think many of these analysis also genuinely try to come up with reasons why the Soviet Union collapsed. But of course, they're going to end up emphasizing the factors, uh, the, the factors that you know, Xi Jinping himself would emphasize while downplaying those factors that um, are deemed as not um, as important. Uh, so at the end, you end up um, sort of with a conclusion that uh, as long as the party remains strong enough, cohesive enough, um, as long as the, uh, the, 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 the party strengthens its ideology and therefore its organization, it will be able to weather all sorts of domestic and international challenges. Um, so ultimately, the emphasis is on the party state itself, uh, because uh, ultimately, right, the conclusion is that, well, the Soviet Union collapsed because something is wrong with the party state itself, the party state itself was eroded ideologically and organizationally, and that was the root of the problem. Um, and I think that that is what Xi Jinping himself probably would have said. You, you just mentioned something which I wanted to get to next, which is where, so we, 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 we have and we will talk a bit more about areas where some of these analyses align with um, or seem to reflect priorities um, and accepted framings by the center. I was curious though, it, 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 a few of you mentioned the Zhang and Zhang article where there was a criticism of the overconcentration of power. And of course, um, history has always been a contested battleground for making subtle criticisms of, of, of the leader. Um, and, and it's arguably one of the reasons that Beijing polices history so so closely. Um, I wonder if anyone could, who, who remembers it, could talk a bit more about that Zhang and Zhang reference or criticism. And did anyone else notice any elements of these analyses which you found surprising, either because they veered off of the accepted propaganda path or they were ahead of where Beijing might wanna be on some of these issues? I'm curious if anything else stuck out to anyone. It's fine if they didn't. I just want to... <laughs> but I just wanted to uh, share my impression of these authors. I feel like as Zhou mentioned, Zhou Fengrong mentioned in her review that there are two groups of uh, scholars approaching this uh, topic and uh, there seems to be a dividing line between the two camps and one are from the historians camp and the others from the Marxist uh, theorist camp then the the historians uh, uh, tend to be more uh, I, I wouldn't say objective but still quite a fact uh, uh, respecting uh, why the Marxist of Started, departed from a predetermined thesis already, and, and they organized or manipulate facts to conform to their predetermined uh, uh, conclusions. So, um, Zhou, I actually have a lot of respect for this uh, scholar. Um, I did a little bit uh, uh, search up of her past work and find that she uh, published uh, uh, some uh, very uh, sharp criticism of Li Shengming uh, years ago. Um, and we know that Li Shengming was the author of the uh, script writer for two very influential documentaries uh, meant for the education of Communist Party members. Um, and the, uh, those were made in uh, 2007 and 2013. And, uh, and Zhou actually published criticism, uh, very sharp criticism, uh, 
of both of these documentaries. And she said this, those documentaries are uh, really uh, disrespect, disrespect respect for historical facts. So they're illogical and totally sloppy. That's what her words were. And, and uh, she said this, if you use these documentary for educating the party members, it's totally misleading. Um, and so I, I and think as you, the question you had earlier about whether they're simply the, the scholars are doing uh, Xi Jinping's bidding. Uh, and I don't think it's completely so. Maybe some of them are. Um, but even those who are uh, in line with uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, um, ideas or thoughts, those people have had these uh, views prior to Xi Jinping's uh, coming to uh, power. So like uh, Xi Jinping had been active but prior to she and, and all of these authors like Zhuo, um, had published uh, stuff before Xi Jinping uh, was in power. So I think um, um, two points of possibilities if the, some of them fall in line with Xi. One is that they truly believed what they have said. And the second is that they're opportunists, that they find that this ideological uh, centrality is uh, uh, ruling the day, then it's uh, beneficial for them uh, uh, to uh, jump on the bandwagon and uh, write on that. Um, and I think that um, uh, what you have seen uh, in the divergence of views among the four, author, uh, four authors and uh, essays, you could see that the debate hasn't stopped yet, that the counter voice, even though it's subdued, it still exists there. It hasn't died out. So like John, and you know, implicitly mentioned that uh, you, you the, 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 one of the Soviet mistake was uh, uh, concentration, over concentration of power. Uh, and, and Zhou also, you know, very uh, indirectly critiqued the, uh, the uh, uh, leftist view in, in, her, in her review essay. So I think that the, the, the debate is still going on. Um, Jude, if I could jump in. Please. Well. Um, so hopefully, this, I don't know if this is exactly answers your question, but um, it might not be quite surprising, um, but I think it's perhaps maybe the greatest source of tension that I see in these analyses. Um, you know, we've had people talk, for example, about, you know, Khrushchev and, and, and Gorbachev, and, you know, the person you're skipping over is Brezhnev, right? And the, I think the role of Brezhnev in these analyses is very interesting because, you know, as, as Chung Chan has said, right, on the one hand, there's a tremendous amount of concentration on the deterioration of the party itself, right? And the party apparatus and the personnel and what this means, stagnation, corruption, um, you know, people mouthing things they don't really believe in terms of, you know, ideology. Um, and that's associated with sort of the stability of cadres period, the Brezhnev period, when the party sort of gets fat and happy and ceases to be revolutionary. Um, the problem is, right, that China, you know, the, the current Chinese leadership still very much remembers the Cultural Revolution, um, which was driven by Mao's desire to avoid revisionism and shake up the party. And they don't want to go back to that. Um, so the question is, right, how do you shake up the bureaucracy, shake up the party, keep it on its toes and close to people and ideologically pure without going through some sort of violent shakeup, which would likely lead to rebellion within the party, right? The party doesn't want to go through that anymore. Um, and so I think that's probably the most difficult question coming out of these analyses is how do you avoid stagnation without the kind of disruptions the party went through in the past and doesn't want to go through again? Yeah, I wanted to, um, I was going to just quickly read from the uh, Jeremy sticking with this sort of continuity line, I, I was actually one of the things I was thinking about is, and I'm going to read the Zhang and Zhang quote um, on the section two of the article where they highlight under the Brezhnev period, um, this this weakening of collective leadership. And I was just to, so I'll, let me just read this quickly. So uh, they write um, during the Brezhnev period, not only was the longstanding phenomenon of quote rule by the voice of one man end quote, in the party not corrected, but the phenomenon of individual arbitrariness was strengthened instead. Senior leaders of the CPSU, Communist Party of the Soviet Union, gave up inner party supervision and collective leadership, replaced the wisdom of the majority with the will of the individual or the will of the few, and made decisions solely based on subjective feelings. Um, and what's interesting, of course, is from the history resolution in China in 1981, you know, Deng's August 18th, 1980 speech, where he criticizes the same sort of pathology in the reform, the post Mao reform period, this sort of central argument on needing to put in buttresses against sort of uh, er erosion of collective leadership 
has been just such a key diagnosis of the pathologies of, of the Cultural Revolution period. Are we over-interpreting this Zhang and Zhang article to see them as making an oblique criticism of the contemporary leadership? Or are they just making a criticism of Soviet pathologies that looks to us untrained external eyes as if they are making an oblique criticism of the, contempt, the current leadership in China? We're not in their heads, so we don't know, but I'm curious if this might, we might see in the margins of the Soviet studies avenues for scholars to be making criticisms of the contemporary direction of Chinese politics. Well, if I may jump in, I mean, I, as, as um, others on the panel have pointed out, uh, there is still a debate within, within the field of Soviet studies. And uh, Professor Zhuo is, is certainly an outspoken uh, 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 scholar. Um, and her position in the Central Party School gives her an audience. And, and same for Zhang and Zhang. Um, I mean, it, so it, the timing of this piece, though, is interesting. So it was published in 2021. And you know, one question would be whether a similar type of article can appear today in, in one of these uh, journals now that we have had yet another party congress and the trends have become even clearer. So, you know, I mean, this this perhaps is you know something we can debate as a as a, as a group. I mean, was there any ambiguity in 2021? But I mean, certainly there is considerably less ambiguity today about uh, where the Chinese leadership is going. Uh, but but I feel that even though uh, one type of explanation appears to have uh, dominated, namely the ideological, there's still room for for other types of of arguments uh, in in the in in, in the field of. Sovietology as practiced by historians and Marxist scholars uh, about the reasons of the Soviet collapse. You know? uh, yeah, I, I agree with Martin that uh, there's uh, room for debate and the, the debate has a real implication for real world politics in China. Um, the uh, I, we are not in the heads of Zhang Zhang or Zhou, but I I feel like uh, they all understand. They're smart people. They all understand what they say in their essay uh, has uh, relevance to the uh, current uh, political debate in China. Um, so I I was looking at the, the review. So the other author Hu Zhongyue mentioned something about I think it's him or uh, mentioned about uh, uh, you know these. Um, a mistaken uh, uh, move during the Soviet period when they smelled the leaders. Uh, so uh, we, which really tried to bring back the uh, uh, the leaders authority or the uh, uh, personality cult of leaders that in his view should be uh, maintained uh, rather than be destroyed. And he thinks this is one of the uh, biggest mistakes that the, the Soviet uh, society made. Um, I, I think he had an eye on the current uh, uh, discussion in Chinese society, if, if not in open uh, dis uh, discourse, but implicitly people knew this is something that uh, uh, that concerns uh, uh, political observers of China, which is that you have seen the uh, reemergence of a personality cult of the leaders. Uh, that's con controversial from the Deng Xiaoping and uh, at least until the Jiang period and, and also through the whole period. So that's something new that the people need to have a, a grapple on it. How, how do you accept it? How do you square that with the past 30, 40 years of a reform that which is to undermine that kind of uh, mild period uh, cult of uh, uh, personality cult? So I think, yes, uh, they, they do understand what they say. Uh, it could have political um, consequences. Peng, I, I wanted to ask you, um, we've talked a lot today uh, on the, the strong ideological component of a lot of these assessments. And of course, you know, your wonderful book, The Return of Ideology, uh, which was looking at uh, a sort of a, a, a post-reform effort to rebuild a new sort of ideological component of, of regime um, resilience. I wondered if you could situate this body of literature attempting to reinterpret the Soviet Union's collapse in a strong ideological, with a strong ideological component, how that you see that fitting in with the broader project under Xi Jinping of constructing a more um, resilient, 
uh, uh, enduring ideological uh, framework um, in, in other areas. Do you see these two as sort of connected? Oh, I think they are absolutely connected. Um, you know, if you look at Xi Jinping's entire ideology building efforts, it's all about safeguarding the party, making sure the party keeps its um, ideological cohesion and therefore its disciplinary and organization co uh, organizational cohesion. So when we talk about ideology, we should never forget the fact that ideology serves a purpose and the purpose is to keep the party cohesive and, and help the party keep its sense of mission and therefore its fighting strength. So without ideology, right? You've got loose discipline, you've got uh, a deteriorating morale and eventually everything's gonna fall apart. Uh, rampant corruption, right? Uh, people just sort of start serving their own self-interests. So that's why ideology is so important for Xi Jinping, because it's the centerpiece of his revitalization of the Leninist party state in China. Um, and for him, that's the key to sort of um, uh, ensure regime resilience. So this entire discussion, you know, it's really to highlight the importance of the party state itself. Uh, to uh, how to make sure that the party stay, stays um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, ideologically and organizationally cohesive um, and uh, have a sense of mission and therefore has a sort of combat strength. Um, so that's what this whole discussion is all about, you know, um, and, and I do think uh, it seems that they do all converge on this point, even though, you know, obviously other factors are being mentioned, uh, but ultimately, you know, this is all a part of highlighting uh, the importance of, you know, making sure that uh, the party stay, would stay afloat, uh, no matter what kind of domestic and international challenges there would be. Chang, I was just thinking, of course, because half of your book also looked at um, what was occurring in, in Russia as well. I'm curious for, for everyone here who has a thought on this, and I know nothing about this, how does the, the, the historiography of the collapse of the um, Soviet Union differ or overlap with evolving assessments in Russia? And I'm especially curious if there is, and we may not know, and if we don't, we could just tell me to, to move on but i just be curious do we know anything about whether or not dynamics in in russia especially over the last sort of 10 15 20 years under putin that you're seeing similar dynamics of a sort of reinterpretation of the collapse of the soviet union that redound to regime legitimacy and of course it seems to be one of the sort of bedrock areas where she and putin absolutely agree is that the collapse of the soviet you know, union was a historical tragedy. Um, so, you know, Chung, do you have any, I see you nodding. So I, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, there are obviously some important parallels, but there are also pretty significant differences. Um, the differences are obvious, you know, because the current Russian regime has already officially abandoned communist ideology, right? There's no longer, you know, a ruling communist party in power. So naturally, you know, it's not going to talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the ideological and organizational strengths of the Leninist party per se. But I do think uh, both narratives share something in common, which is the emphasis on the strong state itself. Um, so in the case of China, right, a strong state and a strong party state, you know, these two are basically overlapping, but in the case of Russia, you know, there is definitely this emphasis on, uh, the, the, you know, the essential role of a strong state in maintaining domestic stability and international competitiveness, and that's indeed Putin's top priority for the past several decades, ever since he came to power, you know, because after all, the Putin era could be seen as a reaction to the pretty chaotic 1990s Yeltsin era, which was, um, <laughs> you know, unstable and um, clearly just not really a strong state, a weak state. Uh, so uh, that part, I think, is something that Xi and Putin share uh, in common. The emphasis on building a strong state to maintaining the central authority. Uh, in the case of China, that would be the authority of the party center. 
and then in the case of uh, Russia, that would be the authority of Putin himself, uh, the, pre the, 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 the presidential position itself. If I may jump in as well, I mean, another parallel is that in the last decade in Russia, the um, ideological infiltration um, element has gotten a lot of play. So uh, there is this book by Karamurza, The Manipulation of Consciousness, that appeared in 2011. And it focuses on American ideological warfare um, in the 1970s and then 80s, the Helsinki process, but also uh, the, the American uh, contribution to it and how this undermined the Soviet Union. So this essay on the manipulation of consciousness has been translated into Chinese and it, it, is, it is something that certainly has been added to the already existing Chinese assessments about um, the ideological element and peaceful evolution and, and how um, the, the United States uh, contributed to the Soviet collapse. So, you know, there I do see um, another parallel in, in Chinese and Russian thinking about the collapse. I would just to build off that, I think, you know, as, as Chung Chun said, right, both analyses had sort of, um, you know, converged on the idea of a strong central state. Um, but, you know, Martin points an interesting point, which is that in terms of, you know, strong vis-a-vis -vis whom, um, and to a certain degree, right, the analysis in China has been strong vis-a-vis -vis potential opposition forces inside the country, um, sources of destabilization inside the country. Well, I think the Russian historiography has converged much more on strong vis-a-vis -vis the outside. So the role of outsiders, the role of the West as an oppositional force, um, it's present to a degree in the Chinese analyses, but it's much more prominent than the Russian analyses. Um, and that, you know, tells us something, for example, about not only the agendas of, of the two countries, but, you know, what they see as, as, the, as the primary threats and how strong they, they see, you know, themselves vis-a-vis -vis potential adversaries now. Well, one thing that, Jeremy, that actually gets to a, what feels like a tension, although maybe, at, maybe I'm the only one who sees this, uh, but it feels like a tension between this corpus of work, and there's a lot of this in the um, sort of thinking about the, the nature of organizational, ideological, political security risks to the regime and how we always need to be aware of them. They're, they're, they're always, you know, knocking at the door. Cadres always need to be vigilant. This, of course, motivates the, the historiography on the collapse of the Soviet Union is because of the shared, you know, governance architecture um, ideological origins. But on the other hand, China has this narrative of China's political system as being this sort of uniquely successful um, uh, uh, um, uh, construction, which is superior to alternative models. Um, and so there seems to be on the one hand, like we're, we're you know, the barbarians are at the gate. We're, we're you know, we've got um, tendencies toward these pathologies of corruption, ideological, organizational laxity, indiscipline. So that's the internal narrative, sort of cadres, always be vigilant, always think of danger in times of peace. But then the external part is basically, we've got this amazingly sophisticated political architecture that solves problems. Now that may just be two different audiences um, and that might not be contradictory, but it feels like a, you know, when you look at them both in parallel, two entirely different stories they're telling. It, 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 does anyone else pick up on that? Or is, is that just a matter of external propaganda trying to sell the China model to other audiences while Xi Jinping basically trying to stave off, you know, real worries about the tendencies of the system to lean towards corruption or ideological indiscipline? Just might be a thought in my own head, in which case I'm happy to let it, <laughs> let it pass. But I don't know if anyone else sort of. But this is an interesting angle to look at it. But um, my guess is that um, when China projects this uh, uh, victorious and uh, um, quite confident image of itself uh, through the angle of um, like China Dream or China Model or what's the new name, the socialist with Chinese characteristics in the new era. <laughs> I can't finish the term, but why they're projecting the uh, positive image, uh, that seems to be the facade the, to cover up a, a deep running, uh, very, very serious concern about regime security, regime legitimacy, social stability, 
ethnic unrest, and that's both are happening at the same time in their narrative. And it uh, looks like uh, there is a tension, but in fact, uh, they work uh, with each other. The two narratives work together to weave a story that uh, in order to uh, uh, maintain China's uh, you know, uh, positive facade, you do need to guard against all these threats from both external and internal hostile forces. That's the, for that's the phrase that they use. Um, so uh, we are uh, glorious, we are triumphant because we are able to fend off all these uh, hostile uh, forces. Uh, uh, but, but if we let our guard down, then uh, the, our China dream will, not, will never be accomplished. So that's the uh, uh, two parts of the same story to me. I think um, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Inan uh, just said. So what's interesting for me is um, I agree that the, this confidence is a facade. It's, it's external and then uh, inside the deep insecurities. So what's interesting to me is that there are those tens of thousands of pieces on the Soviet collapse, but there's certain issues that don't get much play. So Tiananmen doesn't really get mentioned. You know, it cannot be because it's a taboo. Um, eth ethnicity is extremely problematic, so there's not much discussion of it. Uh, something that Inan mentioned earlier today, this issue of the Communist Party losing the support of the people, it's mentioned obliquely. NGOs and, you know, in, in the way in which they, they destabilize communism, I mean, they don't, they don't really get much play uh, in, in these essays or, you know, the role of organized religion, for instance. So, I mean, there are hints and one has to read between the lines, but, but I, I do feel that I, I, I really, um, that Inan put it uh, very well, that um, externally the regime is projecting confidence, but internally they're deep insecurities. If I can... Um, we, we've got three minutes left, so I wonder if I could put out a thought and let you all tell me if it um, has any merit or is stupid, uh, but just to try to, you know, force us to stick the landing with a so what. Um, seems to me there were, there were, there's an element of what China could be doing to study the collapse of the, the Soviet Union, which could organically aid the resiliency of the Communist Party. It strikes me that there's a way of learning lessons from the collapse of the Soviet Union, which could be the wrong lessons, and if, if ingrained, could lead to an increasingly fragile Communist Party. It strikes me they're on the second path right now, that if, if, this, um, if the historiography of the collapse of the Soviet Union really if, comes out with a few key, quote unquote, insights, which is basically we need to, you know, impose more ideological sort of con control and constraints. We need to centralize more um, uh, party over everything, no ideological laxity, you know, a real sort of fortress China lesson learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union. That will not aid the resiliency, uh, um, the stability and the health of the Communist Party. So there seems to be this real tragic irony that some of the, the lessons being learned in the sort of the bulk of the Soviet studies in China right now, you know, downstream of Xi Jinping's worldview are likely to undermine the strength and resiliency of the Communist Party rather, rather than aid it. That's my thought. I'm curious as a closing thought, does, does anyone see that similarly um, uh, or, or, or have sort of a, a different so what big picture thought on what this type of thinking on the collapse of the Soviet will mean for China. I think I agree with you, Jude, but I also want to highlight something that Chung mentioned, which is that scholars do not form opinions independently of the general line that is set up by the leadership. And in the 1990s and in the early aughts, there was um, a, a great degree of uncertainty which way China might go. And there was greater pluralism in terms of scholarly inquiry. And you know, that moment appears to have, to have passed. So to the extent that these lessons may undermine the long-term stability of the Communist Party, I mean, it's, it's, it's the party's own doing. That's my sense. Yeah. My quick comment is that I think uh, the the leftist uh, lessons that learned from the collapse of the Soviet Union will in the short term benefit the role of the party to secure its authority over the Chinese society, but it will hurt Chinese national interests overall, not the party interests, but the national interests, which will in the long term uh, um, compromise the role of the party. <laughs>
So my quick comment, uh, first, I would say that, you know, if this does end up undermining the CCP, um, we should not necessarily view that as a tragedy. I'll just say that, uh, number one. Um, and number <laughs> two, right, it, we, there's a, the form of ideology and the content of the ideology. So they're trying to impose the form of the ideology, but what the content of Xi Jinping thought is, is still very nebulous and frankly, very vague. Um, and so it might not quite be the straitjacket we imagine. Comrade Friedman, you've not not been reading Xi Jinping thought closely enough. If you think it's nebulous, it is. It is the fount of all wisdom. Uh, Chung, any final thoughts or words? Um, I think the fundamental dilemma is that how do you revitalize the Lenin Party state? We saw creating a situation of over concentration of power, and then ends up creating a new host of problems, which then end up undermining the party state itself. So I think that's the really big paradox right there for the party state. And I don't think there is a clear solution at this point. Well, that's a great, um, uh, that's a great place to leave it, which is with a, with a question uh, about how they're going to solve this fundamental governance challenge. Um, I want to really, really thank uh, the four of you. This was a great um, great discussion. Again, want to give my um, sincere thanks to Martin for for being a Sherpa through this entire uh, really interesting process. Um, and uh, Jeremy uh, Chung Inan, just thank you for your really excellent uh, insights and, and contributions. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, the uh, video for this event will be available um, on the CSIS website and on YouTube. So um, would we greatly appreciate it if you share this with friends, colleagues, contacts who you think might be similarly interested. Maybe Xi Jinping should watch this to get some genuine inspiration for how he can revitalize the party, uh, or at least how he can avoid making some um, key mistakes. So uh, thanks, everyone. Have a, have a great week, and um, see you at a future Interpret China event. Thank you.